It's quaint looking, but this quaintness is also tied to a bomb that will kill. So it's technology that looks cute. It looks like a toy. They call it the Kettering Bug, which is a cute name. But in reality, it's a weapon of war designed to destroy an enemy's capacity to fight. The plan is to send hundreds of these things, maybe thousands of them, for very specific targets that are deep behind enemy lines that are far beyond what artillery can reach and are too dangerous for a pilot to take his bomber or his fighter back in that area. The first flight tests were a series of comical errors. But then, after weeks of crashes, the Kettering Bug became the world's first cruise missile in 1918. People had been flying for only 15 years, and here was an aircraft that flew without a pilot. It had an autopilot invented by mechanical genius Elmer Sperry. The heart of his machine was a gyroscope, a fast spinning disc that stayed stable even while the aircraft was in motion. Connected to the steering with pneumatic pipes, the gyro was supposed to make the bug fly in a straight line. That was the theory. But gyroscopes have one big problem. They drift over time. The gyros in the Kettering Bug were no exception. They had trouble staying on course. They brought dignitaries from Washington, D.C. to Dayton, Ohio to show it off. And it takes off, but it keeps flying. And instead of flying straight for about a mile and a half like they wanted it to fly, it ends up veering off and starts flying around toward the city of Dayton. Well, this is a top secret weapon. They don't want anybody to know about it, so they all jump in their cars and they start chasing after this thing as it's buzzing along at 50 miles an hour, which trying to chase down country roads around Dayton in 1917 must have been very interesting. It finally goes out and it runs out of gas and it crashes into a farmer's field. And the farmer comes out, oh, an airplane just crashed out here, but I can't find the pilot. Well, to maintain the secret, they grabbed some flying, a flying suit from the back of one of the cars and said, well, here's the pilot. He jumped out with a parachute. Well, they didn't have parachutes for airplanes at that time. But the farmer believed him, and they kept the secret. Building the Kettering Bug had taught missile builders valuable lessons. But in the end, the grandfather of the Tomahawk never saw battle. By changing from rocket to plane, the Tomahawk increases its range massively. It drops its burnt out rocket booster and fires up a jet engine that can fly it for 1,500 miles at 550 miles per hour on a single tank of fuel. In the 1950s, such an engine was unthinkable Jet engines were huge gas guzzlers. Cruise missiles were enormous, too big for a submarine. What missile builders needed was a miniature jet engine. It takes precision to build even a big jet engine. Making them smaller and more precise would be a tall order. In 1964, the solution came from an unlikely place. The U.S. Army had been looking for a way to fly a soldier to the battlefield. Fast-burning rocket technology had failed. Enter the jet belt. Of course, the concept started with a rocket belt, but you only had about 20 seconds of life. So then the thought was get an air breathing engine, which will take less fuel so you could get, with a given amount of weight, you could get much more flight time. But there was a real question about whether you could design an engine this small. It was thought probably you couldn't. The engineers at Williams International put their heads together. 
So the challenge we had was to take an engine actually a little bit larger than this, consisting of about 6,000 parts, and compress it down into a very much smaller part count. One trick Williams used was to build highly complex parts like turbine rotors out of a single piece of metal. They radically simplified every component until they had an engine with only 600 parts. Weighing in at only 68 pounds, it was small enough to fit on a man's back. It's pretty accelerating. So it's almost like somebody grabbing me by the seat of the pants and just lifting me up. It's pretty interesting. Test pilot Bob Quarter loved showing off the new gadget. I watched Bob fly it. He had very precise altitude control. He flew it in front of our building at one time where we had a big tree and it was in the fall and he could uh, point to some leaf he was going to pick up. And he did fly up in the tree. This, this tree was like 60 feet tall. And he went over and picked a leaf off. The jet belt spawned a series of prototypes that looked more like James Bond than G.I. Joe. But the military lost interest in these magnificent machines. Maybe they realized that on a battlefield, flying soldiers could easily become sitting ducks. The jet belt never took off commercially, but left one important legacy. Its small jet engine was a boon to missile builders. Now they had the technology to make missiles small enough for submarines, yet so powerful they could fly hundreds of miles. Once a tomahawk enters the cruise phase of the mission, it begins seeking on its target, and the hunt begins. Next on Megastructures. We now return to Megastructures. As the Tomahawk cruises towards an enemy's coast, it faces the hardest task of all, flying hundreds of miles without getting lost. Navigation has always been the biggest headache for missile designers especially during the Cold War, when the targets for U.S. missiles were on the other side of the planet, over 5,000 miles away. Over such distances, a tiny error could add up to a big miss. Accuracy seemed impossible without a pilot. In 1946, aeronautical engineers designed a missile to end the dreaded navigation problem forever. They called it the snark. This is one of the last remaining snarks in the world, restored to its former glory by the U.S. Air Force. Weapons technician Jim Oskins used to maintain these missiles. Oh, boosters and all. Cool. Oskins hasn't been near a snark in years. It's nice to see the old girl in one piece again. Yep, she's pretty nice. It was an extremely ambitious project, considering they were using 1950s technology in the guidance system. The Snark had a radically new guidance system, which used an ancient navigation aid, the STARS. Using a telescope, the missile would track the position of a single star right above its flight path. Once it had locked onto it, the missile found its exact bearing and could correct its course. Nice idea, but Snark was plagued by failures. What happened with the one I saw was one booster fired and the other one didn't. It got off the launcher, but it just went into the beach. A lot of smoke, <laughs> a lot of flame, and a lot of people running. Nobody was hurt, fortunately. We were not impressed, I might add. <laughs> Star navigation worked fine in the lab, but not on a missile bouncing through the air at 650 miles per hour. This was one of the first missiles they ever tried to launch out of Cape Canaveral. And since the guidance system was 
very, very unusual at the time. Very, very experimental. They had a lot of failures. And most of them ended up in the ocean right off the coast of Cape Canaveral. So there was a joke going around, they called it snark infested waters. Right? <laughs> which, was, which was true. There was no stretch of the imagination there. It was true, there were a lot of them out there. The snark was a fantastic failure. The stars were not the answer. Solution of the problems involved in long-range missiles would need the cooperation of more branches of science than any other project in history. Missile designers kept looking for the elusive navigation aid. And a team led by Walter Hess found it while dreaming up a truly apocalyptic missile. Supersonic low-altitude missile, SLAM. It was uh, the most interesting project I ever worked on. It, it, it had all the glamour of being an immensely destructive weapon system. It was a wonderful project. SLAM was designed to fly into the Soviet Union at three times the speed of sound and wreak havoc. It had 16 one megaton warheads and it would go to 16 different addresses, ejecting those warheads upward like a seat ejection me mechanism, and it would fly so fast that by the time they exploded, it would be out of harm's way. The l missile literally glows red because the temperature of the skin and stagnation temperature is over 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The shock wave of this massive missile at that high, high speed at near the ground has a huge effect. All normal buildings that we know would just be knocked over. But how could a speeding missile navigate between 16 targets many miles apart? One of our guys, Bill Hallmark, came up with the idea that every piece of ground has got a unique fingerprint. Using topographic maps, Bill Hallmark and his team translated the valleys and ridges of the landscape into a digital map and uploaded it into the SLAM's computer. They called their invention fingerprint. SLAM would bounce a radar beam off the terrain it was flying over and compare it to the map stored in its memory. This is how it would zero in on its targets. Well, we had a configuration of 50 missiles attacking uh, simultaneously the Russian continent. And then each one, of course, would carry 16 weapons. That's 800 one megaton warheads you'd literally destroy Russia. In the end, the State Department determined that this would be so upsetting in the balance of terror, it was thought to be wise not to deploy the weapon system. It would just escalate the balance of power one more notch upward. And maybe Russia, thinking this system would come on, would want to deploy some of their missiles before we had it. The government killed the SLAM project in 1964 and put the fingerprint technology on the shelf. But when work began on the Tomahawk in the 1970s, it was rediscovered and transplanted into this missile where it works to this day. Radar navigation gives the missile another amazing feature, stealth. As the Tomahawk reaches the coast, it drops down